Wow, it's time to get the party balloons out because this is our very last topic of the year. It is a two-day topic, but uh, we're going to take a big bite out of it today. And then in our next video, we'll finish it up. And that'll be the very last one uh, pertaining to new material for the year. Uh, we've got a very special type of distribution today. In fact, it's so special, it's got its own name, Normal Distribution. It's got a very special graph here that we... Uh, brought a picture in and it's the one that's at the bottom of your reference sheet so we're going to use it a lot today feel I want to encourage you to get that out dig that out of your folder somewhere and have that handy um, you can't read the one that's here on my screen it's a real small picture but everything at the top uh, you know there's a lot of trig formulas there's a little bit with your series stuff right here in the middle and then there's that binomial theorem there and then underneath that's your uh, your normal distribution curve and that's the one we're going to use repeatedly over and over today now, probably the biggest reason that normal distribution is so special and gets its own, uh, you know, special recognition in statistics is that it represents a lot of things that happen in real life. And so, the four best examples that I could think of were um, just right off the bat: the heights of both males and females fit the normal distribution curve. Um, also, uh, another really popular one pertaining to the medical field is blood pressure. Uh, and one that you might be interested in is the scores on standardized tests. Probably the what's the most sta popular standardized test of all time? Yeah, the SATs. You might have those coming up in the next couple weekends. Or um, another popular one is the lengths of parts that are made uh, by machines are normally distributed as well. So we're going to see a lot of examples, but before we dive into any examples, we're, we're going to talk a lot about the chart, that graph, that crazy looking graph, and all of its special characteristics. Our first and biggest definition of the day says that uh, certain data when graphed on a histogram, you probably haven't talked about a histogram in a few years, but here's what a histogram does. Uh, you've got your data on the horizontal axis, also known as the x-axis, and you've got the amount of that data on the vertical axis, also known as the y-axis. It creates what we call a bell-shaped curve, and it's known as a normal curve or a normal distribution. And we've imported a nice picture here at the bottom for you to kind of get a visual image of what, what we mean by a bell-shaped curve. Uh, it's always the tallest in the middle, and then it kind of tapers down and out from there. Here are my three favorite characteristics of a normal curve. Number one, right off the bat, the mean and the median and the mode are all guaranteed to be equal to each other. Now, you guys have done enough statistics to appreciate the fact that that's kind of rare. Um, that doesn't happen on every set of data. So if they mention that the data is normally distributed in the directions, then you can safely assume that the mean, the median, and the mode are all equally to each other, and they occur right here in the middle. You see this line right down the middle? That's where the mean, the median, and the mode are. Uh, number two, that is symmetric about the center. In other words, the red line I just drew down the center, we could fold the graph on that vertical line and the graph would lay perfectly on top of itself. And then the last one here is that 50% of the values are less than the mean. Um, just like this number here indicates everything to the left is 50%. And then there's also 50% of the data that is greater than the mean that falls to the right. So everything to the left is less than and both those words start with the letter L, and everything to the right is greater than the mean or bigger. Well, the first real popular question that we get a lot is they ask us what percentage of the data falls within one standard deviation of the mean. Now, the first thing I want you to do, right where you see that zero, right in the middle, I want you to always put your symbol for mean. That's the X with the bar above it. And then go to the right until you see that one. That's what we say the mean plus one standard deviation, your lowercase sigma, subscript x. And then go back to negative one, walk to the left. That's what we call one standard deviation below the mean. And what we, they want to know what percentage falls within that interval. So I'm going to draw a bold line there and a bold line there. And what my job is is to try to add up the four percentages that you see here. And if you add those rascals together, uh, you're going to hopefully end up with 60 8.2%. So we're going to, sometimes we round it off to 68, sometimes we do get real specific and call it 68.2, but that's something you want to memorize. Very, very similar question here, except they just tweaked this, said how, what percentage of the data falls within two standard deviations? So find the, we're going to start with the mean right there in the middle. Let's walk two standard deviations to the right, 
practice good notation here. And, and I didn't mention it on the last slide, but I want you to kind of draw a mock curve. It doesn't have to be super fancy, but drew, do a mock curve that's very similar to the one I have here on my screen. And so we're, we're two standard deviations above uh, over here, and then we're two standard deviations below right there. And what we're going to do is I'm going to draw a bold line right there. I'm going to draw a really bold line right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the 4.4, and then I'm going to add the 9.2 and the 15 and the 19. And actually, you could stop right there and just double that sum, or you could continue to add all of these little rascals right here. And when you get done adding those, you should end up with approximately 95%. So how much data falls within uh, two standard deviations? We're going to say 95%. All right, we're cooking right along, and I bet you could tackle this one on your own. We don't know what percentage falls within three standard deviations. Uh, again, start with a new, fresh uh, drawing. We've got the mean in the middle. We've got three standard deviations above right there. So I'm going to say X bar plus three standard deviations. I'm going to walk all the way to the left down here. That's X bar minus three standard deviations. And I'm just going to start right there. In fact, the 0 0.5 is the first one I add. And then 1.7, 4.4, 9.2, all the way across. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then stop right there at the 0.5. And you should end up with approximately 99% of the data falls within three standard deviations. So I just want to summarize the last three slides that we did because those percentages are going to be something we do have to memorize. We'll see those on our Monday Bite Size Quizzes and, and they'll really pay off when, by the time we get to Friday's test. But uh, within one standard deviation, 68% uh, of the data. Within two standard deviations is 95% of the data. And then within three standard deviations is approximately 99% of the data. You don't have to necessarily worry about that 0.7 we threw in there. So those are the three to memorize. Next thing I want to do is um, I want to introduce you to percentiles, and then we'll show you how they pertain to that curve. This is one of my favorite concepts in, in all of math, and it depends. It, it tells you how you rank amongst your peers or the competition. So my question to you is, it says here, if, the, if your next test score ranks at the 80th percentile, what does that really mean? Um, the first, it does not mean that you got 80% correct, okay? That's the, that's the biggest misconception. Um, your percentile rank doesn't tell you how many questions you got right. All it does is it tells you how you compared to your peers. So the 80th percentile, what that means is you outscored, or in other words, you scored higher than 80% of your peers. Or, whoops, I can't spell. Um, or by comparison to everybody else that took the test. So that's what your percentile rank tells you. All right, so how do you find percentiles on this crazy looking curve with all the little percentages? Well, here's, here's my strategy. What I do is I start in the middle, um, right at the mean, okay? So in parentheses, because the mean, uh, the, the median, all of those things are the same on the curve, at the 50th percentile. Now, how do you know that the mean is the 50th percentile? Well, we said earlier 50% of the data lies to the left and 50% lies to the right. So right there in the middle, I want you to put a 50th on your sketch there in your notebook, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're either going to add or subtract the little percentages you see, depending on whether you are below, or let's say above first, above or below the mean. And again, I think it helps like adding and above both start with the letter A. So if you go above the mean, you are adding the percentages. So for instance, let's say I told you your test score was one standard deviation above the mean, right? What I would do is I would start with the 50, and then I would add the 19.1, and then I would add the 15 also. And by the time I get done adding those three numbers together, I would get, let's see, I'm going to draw a little arrow here, the 84th, okay, I'm disregarding the point one if you'll allow me, 84th percentile. So that's pretty darn good, isn't it? If your score one standard deviation above the mean, that means you outscored or outperformed 84% of your peers. Not too shabby. Now by comparison though, on four, if I had bad news and I said, you know what, your score was one standard deviation below the mean, you again start with the 50 here, but then you would subtract 19, you would then subtract the 15 as well, and now what you've got, let's see, let's do some fast math here. That'd be 31, uh, 21. 
That would be, if you were one standard deviation below, that would be, oh my goodness, that would be the 16th percentile. So unfortunately, the bad news is, is you only outscored or outperformed 16% of your peers. All right, it's finally time to bust a groove and get some examples in our notebook. These are the types of questions we could see on a quiz or a test that will gradually build up in difficulty. And here's the deal. On a standardized test score, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. as soon as you see that phrase, standardized test, you can assume normal distribution. And as soon as you make a decision that we're working with normal distribution, it is now fair game to draw your bell-shaped curve, just like that. And I want to see a new sketch for every problem we do today. Now, Kathy had a score of 74, and that happened to be exactly one standard deviation below the mean. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my mean right here in the middle, and then I'm going to go one standard deviation to the left. Uh, so I'm going to say X bar minus one standard deviation. Okay, and that was Kathy's score of 74. So let's put the 74 right there. Now here's the deal. The standard deviation for that particular test was a 6. So the gap from her score up to the mean is 6 units. And if I do 74 plus 6, I end up with 80. So the mean for this particular exam was an 80. All right, another standardized test here in example number two. As soon as I see that, I made a decision that it is normal distribution. That's a fair assumption. And I'm instantly going to start drawing my bell-shaped curve. I'm going to put my mean right in the middle here. Now, Phyllis, this time, she scored an 84. And that was exactly one standard deviation above. So we're going to walk to the right. We're going to say the mean plus a standard deviation right there. And that's a score of 84. All right. Now, on this same, this must be the same test, perhaps. Standard deviation was again six. So the gap between those two marks is six units. So I need to do 84 minus six to get an average of 78. Mean 78. We're sticking here, sticking with our theme of standardized tests here. So we've got another bell-shaped curve. New drawing for every single problem. I don't want you. To, it gets way too confusing if we try to use the same drawing repeatedly. Now, this one's got just a slight new twist in it. Laura scored an 85, and that's two standard deviations above the mean. That's impressive. I tell you, it's very difficult to score two standard deviations above the mean. So I got a little X bar plus two standard deviations. Notice I got two hash marks there, and that's a score of 85. All right. Now, in this particular exam, the, the standard deviation was four units. So the gap from there to there is four units and then again the gap from there to there is also four units so what I'm going to do is 85 minus 4 gives me 81 right there that's one standard deviation above and I'll subtract 4 again to get 77 and right there that's your mean now I'm trying to throw you a little curveball on this one try to get a little trickier because a score of 86 falls exactly one and a half that's the curveball uh, standard deviation is below the mean so let's see what our sketch looks like here Got our mean right here in the middle. And what I'm going to do is i got to go below. So let's go one standard deviation below and then another like half. So we're minus one and a half, minus 1.5 standard deviations. Got the minus in there. And that's a score of 86. By golly, that's a pretty high score to be underneath the mean. But anyway, so now the standard deviation they said was two. So guess what? Half of a standard deviation would be one unit. So what I'm going to say is the gap from there to there is one unit, but then the gap from here all the way to the mean is back to a full standard deviation, which is two units. That's a grand total of three units, and if I do 86 plus 3, I'll end up with 89 for the mean. So hopefully, if you have to replay that one, that's not a bad one to replay, because that half standard deviation makes things a little more tricky. All right, we're going to test you on those three big percentages we had to memorize earlier in the video. It says the accompanying diagram in the shaded area it represents 95% of the scores. Now, I need you to appreciate the significance of 95%. That contains um, two standard deviations on either side of the mean. Okay, that's two standard deviations. Every time you see 95%, think two standard deviations. So the 92 here represents that's two above. I'm just going to say plus two standard deviations. And then the 78 right here, that's minus two standard deviations or below. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a hash mark right there for, that's minus one standard deviation. I'm going to put a hash mark right here for plus one standard deviation. So I get it all labeled. 
And uh, basically what I want to do is I want to first find the middle or the average here of 78 and 92. So I'm going to say 78 plus 92 divided by 2. That gave me an average of 85. So that's the mean. And, um, and I'm almost there. Now to get a standard, I'm not, next I want to find the average of 85 and 92. You know, what, what corresponds to this score right there? And the average of those two rascals is going to be about, let's see, uh, let's see, the average I had was 88.5. And again, all I did to get the average was I did 85 plus 92, and I divided that by 2 to get an average of 88.2, or I'm sorry, 0.5, 88.5. Now I can finally figure out the standard deviation. It's going to be the distance from the mean to that first score, and the distance from 85 to 88.5 is three and a half units. All right, our last question here tonight's a real big rascal. It says there's 2,000 freshmen at State University that took a biology test and the scores were normally distributed. We get very excited when we see that phrase normally distributed because it means we can refer to this curve um, with a mean of 70. So let's put that smack dab in the middle. There's my 70. And there's a standard deviation of five and they want me to label not only the mean but three standard deviations above and below the mean. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that five and I'm just gonna continuously add it that's one above, 80 is two above, 85 is three above. Um, if I subtract the five, that means 65 is one below, 60 is two standard deviations below, and 55 is unfortunately three standard deviations below. Now in a different colored marker here, I'm gonna just label, there's my mean, that's plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviations, plus three standard deviations. I'll do the same thing on the south side here, minus one standard deviation, minus two, and minus three standard deviations. Okay, first question. What percentage of the scores fall between 65 and 75? Well, there's something very special about 65 and 75. They both, 65 is one standard deviation below, 75 is one above, and we said earlier in the video from negative one to positive one is a grand total of 68 or 68.2%. Uh, next question, what percentage is between 60 and 70? So let's start at 60, we'll go all the way up to the middle, and what I'm going to do next is I want you to look at that little reference sheet you have, okay? Let's go ahead and import that. Okay, now when you're looking at your little cheat sheet up here, remind yourself that now the 60 corresponds to negative 2 and the 70 corresponds to the mean right here. So what I want you to do is start at negative 2 and go all the way to the middle here. And I want you to do 4.4 plus 9.2 plus 15 plus 19 and see what you get. When I added those four little percentages together, I got a total of 47.7%. And a lot of times they'll be real specific on what, you, what they want you to round to. All right, next question. What percentage of the scores are between 60 and 85? Now again, the 60s, two standard deviations below, and the 85s way over here, it's three standard deviations above. So going back to our sheet here, I'm gonna start at negative two, and I'm gonna go all the way to three above. So we're gonna add up the 4.4, the 9.2, the 15, the 19.1, continue, 19.1, the 15, the 9.2, the 4.4, and then don't forget about the 1.7 and the 0.5. So let's add those rascals up and see what you get. I got a grand total of 97.6 when I added up all the ones that were underlined in green. All right, we're chipping away here. Um, what percentage of the scores were less than 55? I'll tell you what, that's a very small percentage. Uh, 55 corresponds to three standard deviations below. If you find the negative three on the chart and go below that or to the left, it's only 0.1%. That's a minuscule number, very small. Uh, and Okay, what percentage of the scores are greater than 80? Okay, where's 80 correspond? 80 is two standard deviations above, so let's find the two here on the chart. And then above that means go to the right. So let's take the 1.7 uh, that you see here, uh, the 0.5 and the 0.1. If we add those rascals together, I believe we're going to get 2.3%. So above means to the right, less than means to the left. couple more questions here and we're home free. Instead of asking for the percentage, they now ask me how many students in that class scored between a 60 and a 70. Um, now remember, in Part B, we said it was 47% or 47.7%. 
Now that's, do you remember how many students were in the class? Let's scroll up. It says 2,000 students were in that class. So what I'm going to say here is that 47.7% of the 2,000 students, I almost forgot my percentage. Now in order to multiply these two rascals, I've got to slide that decimal to the left first uh, to turn it into a regular number. So we're going to go 0.477 times 2,000 students. And when I did that, I got a grand total of 954 students in that class had a score between 60 and 70. That's a lot of students in that group. All right, last question tonight. How many of these students score between a 55 and a 60? Now, unfortunately, I don't think we've calculated this percentage yet. So the first thing I got to do is I got to get the percentage. From 55 to 60 is from three standard deviations below to two standard deviations below. So go to your chart. Start with negative 3, go until you hit negative 2. All you got to do is go 0.5 plus 1.7. That's a grand total of 2.2%, I believe. So 2.2%, um, let's see, 2.2%. Change, move that decimal twice. That's going to be 0 0.022 multiplied by 2,000 students in the class, and that gave me a grand total of 44 students, only 44, not percentage, I almost wrote percentage, that's 44 students out of an entire class of 2,000 scored between a 55 and a 60. So I hope you felt fairly comfortable with the bell curve. We'll get lots of practice tomorrow, and like I said, we are going to do a two-day lesson on this one, so we'll get even more confident um, by the end of that second video.